Live from Penn State, this is Nittany Talk. I'm your host, Danny Vitale, and today we'll dive into corrupt officials, talk about Drake's new album, see if Penn State students are smarter than a third grader, take a look back to the Boston Marathon bombing, and talk all things fall fashion. Now, we have a lot to cover, so let's get to talking. Welcome back to Nittany Talk. Now we're sending it over to the politics panel to discuss corrupt officials throughout the United States government. Take it away, Olivia. Thanks, Danny. I'm Olivia Jean, joined here today by Jay Sobardo, Francie Eber, Ryan Lowry, and Yeo Wan. Corruption in government officials has been an ongoing issue for years now. Today, we are taking a look at current people in power who have committed serious corruption. Now, let's start with George Santos. Well, Santos has kind of been a mess. I mean, we all know that. We've known that for quite Kinda. some time now. Okay, sorry. He's been a major mess. We've all known that. We're all aware of it, but there's so much other stuff going on, we don't focus on it. Uh, he's been charged with 13 different felonies, and not included in that is the fact that he was charged and did not show up to an indictment in Brazil. So not only should he have a criminal record in another country, but he also should possibly have a criminal record here and not be in government. However, although he's not on any important committees, he is probably going to be here till the end of his term, and he announced he's going to rerun, which I think is very interesting, and I don't think it's going to go well for him. I think that he's not even going to win the Republican primary in District 3 of New York, but you know what? I guess he has a chance. And the funny thing about this 13 counts is that he pleaded not guilty, which, why? Because the... <laughs> well, I mean, he can't plead, he can't, he can't I, excuse me, he can't plead guilty. Well, I know, but it's just, it's funny, because... The lies are so blatant, and I don't know why these politicians think they can get away with it, because right next to celebrities, politicians are under public scrutiny and in the public eye even more so than celebrities, I'd say, because we hold them to a higher standard because they're supposed to be the ones running our country and the rest of the world is looking at us. So when you have people like him in there just blatantly lying, making up things about where he went to college, his religion, he said... He was Jewish, and then this, this is kind of funny. He said he was Jewish, and then he kind of like backtracked on what he said and said he was raised Catholic but has Jewish uh, ancestors, so he's Jew-ish. Jew-ish. <laughs> Jew-ish. Jew yeah, which that's kind a hard, of, kind like, of Jew. blows my mind. Like, <laughs> I, I just, what confuses me is that how does someone even put themselves in that position to be that in depth with lies, all the way from education to charity work to actually like serious concerns about what he was doing. I just, it really makes me question what is happening right now. I mean, and, sorry, continue. Yeah, go ahead. No, but just recently he got charged with stealing almost $44,000 from people who donated to his campaign. I mean, that's insane. And even before that, he had lied about donating, about him himself donating $500,000 to his own campaign, and he lied to the Federal Election Com Commission. Like, that's insane. When, in fact, he had less than $8,000 in his personal accounts. And of those $44,000, like, at least 12000 of those have been transferred to his own personal accounts. So we don't know what he's doing that, what he's using that money for. I mean, people trust you to run an honest campaign, and you take their money tens of thousands of dollars. Like, this is not someone that we can trust in office. So it right. kind of makes sense why public trust in the government is so low, because we have these flagrant abuses of power, yeah. frankly, and he's still in office and has still pleaded not guilty, ref is refusing to step down. I mean, it's quite honestly very disrespectful. Well, first of all, before I make my point, my favorite lie of his has to be that he was a Division One athlete. That was the, <laughs> by far the funniest lie ever, because when you look at the guy, you go, huh, then I could probably be a professional. Anyway, uh, he, his ex-campaign manager actually pled guilty. So I don't know 
who is going to want to uh, represent him when he runs? Like, who's going to want to be his campaign manager? I mean, obviously, someone who wants to put their foot in the door, but who wants to represent a liar that, I mean, he got away with it, but didn't really get away with it. When one person's pleading guilty in that situation, you know the rest of them are just as guilty because yeah. there's nothing that his campaign manager knew that he didn't know. So it's just, you, there's nothing you can do but laugh at this point. And I think the bar is just so low right now. It just comes down to like character too. Like, like I, it confuses me how someone even put themselves in that position, especially when you're holding a position of power like that. You know, it's it, actually really upsetting. It's upsetting to me. Um, and it's happening on both sides. It's not just um, Republicans. It's also Democrats. We have Bob Menendez, who is also in quite the trouble right Cold now. Bar Bob. Yeah. Cold Bar Bob. Hey, the Union County, New Jersey resident claims that these are all fraudulent charges against him. He's almost playing the other side. What Donald Trump said, he's saying now, which is very interesting. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be a good situation for him. I mean, he actually, I, I believe, I don't think it was a rally, but he had a speech in Union City, not too far away from where I'm from, actually. He had not a very good attendance for what he's used to, and he just really didn't say anything that people could believe. He said they were all false allegations, although there's evidence on social media of it. The FBI raided his household. They found a car that there's no way he should be able to afford, looking at his financial statements. All stuff like this. It's just crazy. Like, the, I guess just it, it boils down to the stupidity of these people thinking they can get away with it. Like, they found gold bars in in his clothing, in his pockets, money in the walls of his office. Like, how do Straight you think... Right out of a movie, man. Honestly, like, you couldn't even write this. And the other funny thing is that he got off in 2015 on a hung jury for corruption, right. and then nine months later, he engaged in corruption again. So, obviously, he's not learning his lesson, and he thinks he can keep getting away with it. Refusing to step down as well, they say that power corrupts absolutely. Um, corrupts absolutely. I mean, it's very possible that these politicians started off with good intentions, but yeah. once you get into that position of power, it's so easy to be like, oh, it's okay if I take this one bribe if it's for a good cause, and then one bribe turns into ten, and then ten. Is Egypt a good cause? Is Egypt? I don't know. A good question. Because my other thing is, it's great though that he did step down from the chair of foreign relations. That was needed. I thought he was removed. I don't know if he stepped down. I. I could be wrong. From my, my understanding was, was that he was told he would be removed if he didn't step down. So, yeah. You know what's funny about this situation, too, is that his wife, I think, had a, I mean, did have a huge She's part. She's just as guilty. She's being charged as a well. A huge yes. part in this. So it makes me, it makes me think, okay, you think this was like a pre, like, did she have these kind of, I don't, I don't know, but it. it my theory. Come up together, stay together. My theory so is she held secrets for him, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. Be surprised if that was the case. Yeah. I mean, from what I was reading, the connections between her and these other people she was going to, it seemed like it was a it's a messy situation. Yeah. But so taking these two politicians and we just discussed all the corruption that has been happening in politics. I mean, they're not just the only two. There's many of them uh, that have left and s are still in politics. What should be the repercussions for these people that are doing this type of Damage. I mean, they have to be removed. According to the Pew Research Center, the trust in government currently is the lowest it's been in 70 years. I mean, right. only 1% of Americans trust the government to always do what's right, with 15% of Americans trusting the government to do what's right most of the time. So that leaves, well, almost 80% of Americans who don't think the government is going to do what the people need them to do. So there has to be forceful and visible repercussions and consequences for politicians that engage in corruption. They have to be removed. I don't even think giving them the chance to step down is enough, to be very honest. And it's honestly a threat to democracy as well, because this is when you have low trust in government, you have low voter participation. You have low participation in elections. So now what's going to happen? What's going to stop people from holding them accountable, politicians accountable, because they're going to say, it's going to happen anyways, so mm -hmm. what's the point in voting? Right. I'd like to see more of these politicians putting the country before themselves. And when you're getting federally indicted, you should honestly just step down. You shouldn't have to be removed because you like they've caught on to you. You know you did something Game's wrong, over. and everyone knows you did yeah. something wrong. But it, they won't. It's just a, just how things are, are now. I truly do think we are slowly learning our lesson, though. I think we are because I think we're going to start to see some accountability from Menendez. I think he's going to have to eventually, and I, I honestly don't think Santos has a chance of even representing his party 
in running in New York 03. So I think we're going to start to see some accountability as it gets more headlines. But, I mean, this has been something we've been seeing for a long time. I mean, we've seen presidents lie. We've seen Supreme Court members lie. And we've seen them get away with it all the time. But I think the more we hold accountability, the less we're going to see it. Yeah. And I feel like there's more. there's definitely more corruption in the government than we even know about. Absolutely. Yeah. Just, yeah, you can't argue that. It comes down to not what do we do after corruption happens, but I think the real question is how do we prevent it from happening? And you may never get and that's the right that. I think party and leadership. Right, yeah. I think we need party leadership getting involved, like we see Mitt Romney doing it. I mean, he's not really a part of party leadership anymore, but we see him really holding people accountable. So things like that. We need party leadership to really dive in and you know go against people within their own party that lie, even if it might help them sway a vote or two. Yeah, and uh, like you mentioned. Um, the low public trust is really impacting democracy. And I think the first step too, one of the, the biggest steps that we can make as a country in this political realm is, you know, Trump taking accountability for what he did. Because he is the biggest political figure in this, uh, that we've talked about that has had the, this many charges. So what kind example. of example did he set? Yeah. What was that? Exactly, yeah. It's but, a trend. Like, yeah. right. Well, um, we're going to, and this conversation, we don't have enough time, unfortunately. I'm going to throw it back to you, Danny. Thank you, Olivia. Now more than ever, it is crucial that we elect those who have the best interests for the country in mind and not just for themselves. We'll be right back to talk all things entertainment. You see them dancing around, maybe a little electric slide here or there. They are just, even though they're older, they seem so youthful and just so excited to be there and to find love again. Welcome back to Nittany Talk. Fall is the time for new entertainment. Will the new TV show Golden Bachelor really take the gold? Was Drake's eighth studio album really for all the dogs, or was it a rough experience for the fans? Let's send it over to Entertainment for the latest update. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. <laughs> I'm your host, Emma Goldkopf, and today I'm joined with Jordan Spagnoli alongside Avi Shashut, and we are here to give you a weekly entertainment update. We've got everything from music to TV and more. So first off, Drake released his eighth studio album, For All the Dogs, came out October 6th. Um, He's got a bunch of different songs. I believe there are 23 songs on it. We've got features from Bad Bunny, SZA, J. Cole, Lil Yachty, and 21 Savage. And I've heard nothing but good um, reviews about this. I there, mean, what do you guys think? Well, there was just so much hype around this album coming out. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone just couldn't wait to see. And honestly, from all the reactions I've heard, there's been a lot of good things said and especially a lot of people were saying it kind of was giving like that old Drake vibe and it just felt like a really familiar album for yeah, them. Yeah, all the nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love it. What about you? Yeah, I feel like I've heard like a mix of things. I don't know. I was talking to like some people and they were like, some of it sounds a little bit rushed. Ooh, no, yeah, but take. I've heard like the old Drake vibe. So I'm just like wondering, is it giving views? Is it giving, <laughs> you know, think me later or like, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. Yeah. But, um, have you guys gotten a chance to listen to it at all? Well, I will, the one thing I will say, it's a very long album. Oh, yes. Yes. So that's been another critique I've heard from some people. It's a good album, but it's a long album. I've only had the chance to listen to some of the songs, not all of them, but so far, I personally am a fan. I like hearing it, and I feel like that's a very popular public opinion right now. Yes, no, same guess. for me, too. <laughs> and I know he announced after, I'm not sure how big Drake fans are feeling about this, but he said he's going to be taking a break from his music. So I'm wondering how controversial that's going to be. Um, but he said he's taking his time to focus on his health. He said he's made promises to other mm -hmm. people he wants mm -hmm. to keep and work on. So I'm interested to see when we're going to hear from him again. Well, that was an interesting point because when his album was released, he also made a statement saying how he wanted to take time to focus on his health. Didn't get too into detail, but said stuff about some heart issues, I guess. And also, just like you said, just fulfilling those commitments. And honestly, I feel like if you're a fan and you care, that's a good thing. You're, you want to see artists being able to live their lives, to be humans, to be more than just their music. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I feel like Drake has been just doing so much over the couple years. Like, during what? Well, during my freshman <laughs> year, he released an album. During, I think, not even like six months later, maybe a little bit longer than then. Don't quote me. <laughs> um, he just kept on like releasing stuff and right now he's on tour and like it's just it's so crazy yeah. it's like he's been yeah. a workaholic and <laughs> like yeah. and he needs this break and i mean all the bachelors that are now being announced <laughs> i mean that's crazy too i mean yes. what's happening with all of that so mm -hmm. i'm sure there's a new show sweeping the bachelor nation golden bachelor it's 
actually a really interesting concept, I think. It's usually like 20 and 30 year olds trying to find love, but in this new show, 60 and 70 year olds trying to find love. Our first ever Golden Bachelor is Gary Turner. He is 72. And apparently he's looking for love after his wife passed away a couple of years ago. And I honestly, I've been keeping up with the show and it's only two episodes in, so it's really new, but it seems like reactions have been really good. People like it. And I don't know, it's kind of cute, just like old people falling in love. Who yeah. doesn't love to see that? It's so heartwarming. Absolutely. I don't know. When I first heard like the Golden Bachelor, I, I have this image of like gray <laughs> hair or white hair with a cane or something, but like... These these people are kicking. They're like, looking good. They're, they're looking very good, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely watching the episodes and being like, these people are 60, these people are 70, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. And you know, they still seem like so young in spirit. You see them dancing around, maybe a little electric slide here or there. They are just, even though they're older, they seem so youthful and just so excited to be there and to find love again. Yeah, and as they should be. Everyone deserves love, exactly. no matter your age, no matter what you've been through. I Absolutely. Mean. I feel like it's like really inspirational because yeah. like especially as people get older, people are like, will I ever find love? Mm -hmm. Or like when they have a spouse that passes away, they're yeah. like, well, like, what do I do? Kind and of that, like that. Well, that's been a really interesting part of the show is just these people lost their spouses and they're trying for a second chance. And mm -hmm. I think that's really heartwarming. But, you know... I mean, yeah. it's going to be a good one, I yeah. think. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is all the time we have for today. <laughs> I'm excited to see how the new show and the album develop. Back to you, Danny. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Dogs and Golden Bachelors, oh my. Stay tuned for our next segment where we find out if Penn State students are smarter than a third grader. Well, you know what the real question is? Are, are you smarter, smarter than, than a third grader? grader? Welcome back to Nittany Talk. Penn State is widely recognized as an impressive educational institution, but do you see the students carry out that legacy? This week, we went out on the town and found out if college students are smarter than a third grader. Becca, tell us a little about your package. Thanks, Danny. Today, we have something extra special. I know here at Penn State, we all think we are geniuses, but it's easy to forget the basics. My co-host, Neil Azami, and I decided to put some students to the test and see how much they remember from the good old days. Let's take a look. You know, Neela, it is just so hot today. I don't even think I can think. You know, Becca, it really makes me think back to the good old days, you know? Are you talking about third grade? Yeah, I'm talking about third grade. What about third grade? I just feel like it was so much easier. You know, I didn't have to pay attention as much. You didn't have to listen to your professors. Right. But you know what the real question is? Are, Are you smarter, smarter than, than a third, third grader? grader? What is the name for a body of land that is completely surrounded by water? A continent? An island? What is it called? A uh, landlocked... An island. <gasps> uh, island? Wow! Dum dum! Uh, something landlocked? Who was the second president of the United States? This one should be easier than the one I just answered. Um, we're gonna go with. Uh, you got it. Um, Madison. Oh gosh. Andrew Jackson. The Andrew Jackson. Uh, so. John Adams. Was it John Adams? George Washington. <laughs> Close. That was the first. How many bones are in the human body? 200, I forget if it's six or seven. Oh my God. Um. Mm. Oh, um. How many bones in the human body? Right. She's got it. You you're got totally it, you're got so it. close. Is it lower than 100? 127. Like 120? 207. Say 198. Honestly, I'm still giving you a dum dum for that one. That was great. What ocean must you travel across to to get from New York to London? Um. Oh my gosh, Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic? Yeah. Ding 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 ding. J.K. Rowling is the author of what children's book series? Harry Potter. Oh, I know that name. Harry Potter. Um, 
Harry Potter. Come on now. Uh, I read all of them. Harry Potter. What's your favorite one? Oh, I'm going to have to say uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. Mm. Okay. Movie or book? I'm more of a book guy. <gasps> wow. That's great. Good for you. Name all the continents. Oh, um, Asia, Europe, Africa, um, Australia, North America, South America, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what did I forget? Did I say Europe already? I already yep. said Europe. You Antarctica? Europe. North America, South America, Antarctica, Europe, Asia, Africa, and North. India. Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Antarctica, uh -huh. Australia, yep. and Europe. No, I'm wrong. Hold on. <laughs> Australia. How many kingdoms are part of the United Kingdom? United Kingdom. And what are they? Mm, tricky, tricky question. Oh, is it like in the hundreds? It's like single digits? Can I guess like eight? Um, ten? No. I think half of that. Oh, four. Six. Well, there's England, Scotland... Ireland, and I think, is there one more? Yep. I think there's one more. one more. Is it like the Isle of Man? Four. I'm going to say Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales, England. I think W. Oh, uh, Wales. Yes, good job. Where is the Grand Canyon located? Um, I'm going to say the Grand Canyon is located in... Um, totally got it. Ooh. Hmm. What's like the clock noise that you make? I must say somewhere like west, so uh dee do dee do dee do dee do You got this one. It's in the US. I know, I know. I know it's Arizona? Oh, it's in uh, Arizona. She's taking a second. Um, Arizona. Arizona. Oh. Dum, 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 dum. What is the perimeter of a circle called? Oh, the perimeter? A circumference. Like that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the circumference. Right. Yep. The perimeter. Uh, circumference. Think back. You're sitting in your third grade chair. Your desk is shiny. Your pencils are on the floor. Mm -hmm. Your erasers are shaped like cupcakes. Mm. Now, who invented the light bulb? I don't know that. <laughs> I forget. Uh, I'm going to have to go with Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. <laughs> Yay! Dumb, dumb! Today we figured out that Penn State students are smarter than third graders. That's all we have time for today. Who knew that third grade was so difficult? Maybe next time you're sitting in class, try to pay a little more attention. Back to you, Danny. Thank you, Becca. Looks like some of us need to get back in the library, myself included. We'll be right back. He was planning on retiring. Like, he wasn't planning on <laughs> staying on board. It was this case that made him stay. Welcome back to Nittany Talk. The Boston Marathon was a horrible tragedy that shocked the nation just over a decade ago, but many are unaware of the motives, aftermath, and a lesser known murder of a police officer followed by a carjacking and a shooting. This week, we give you all you need to know about the tragedy. Well, thanks, Danny. Welcome to the inaugural edition of Crime Reviews. I'm your host, Ryan Lowey. Today, I'm joined alongside Sam Rascio, Katie Schreiner, and Ava Hines. On April 15, 2013, two pressure cooker bombs went off within 14 seconds of each other killing three, including an eight-year-old boy, and injuring hundreds of others during the 117th annual Boston Marathon. Days later, an MIT campus police officer was murdered with his gun missing, followed by a major carjacking with the vehicle owner being held at gunpoint. With hours later, a shootout between local police officers and two domestic terrorists suspected of the bombing, followed by a 48-hour lockdown throughout the entire city of Watertown and the surrounding communities to locate one of the most dangerous people in the state of Massachusetts at the time. Today, we are going to break down what happened in one of the busiest weeks in the 21st century. This is the inaugural edition of Crime Reviews. Well, Sam, you want to give us a little background on what happened? 
Sure. So I want to start off by why the two brothers chose the place that they bombed. So they mm. were from the town over, and um, a huge, huge race was going on because it was Patriots Day in Boston. So they knew that millions of people would be gathered together to watch the marathon. Um, so what happened was basically two bombs went off in the span of probably a minute to a couple 14 seconds. seconds. 14 seconds. Um, after one another. And law enforcement and everyone had no idea who would do this, what the motive was, and it injured and killed. It injured a bunch of people and it killed three people, including an eight-year-old boy. Yeah, to go off of that, there were also 14 amputations total. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there were 27 hospitals that were helping mm -hmm. aid the scene. And it's crazy because now there are so many en enhanced security measurements that have now been taken place as we go along. We are now on the 125th uh, Boston Marathon in the year 2023. So it's crazy to see how this has affected security to this day for this event. Yeah, it was a, it was just a wild thing all around. <laughs> crazy. Uh, Billy Evans, who was the superintendent of the Boston police at the time, he actually completed the race. And then, you know, mm -hmm. just seconds later, here's a bomb go off. Everyone's mm -hmm. just standing there confused. Then another bomb goes off. Unfortunately, not only did three people die, but one of those three people was a little child. Families were separated. We saw some amputations. And, you know, it was just, it was a terrible situation. And I don't think anybody knew what was going to unfold after it. We all saw a shootout. I mean, we saw right. a mm -hmm. carjacking. Someone held at gunpoint. I mean, it was a crazy sequence of events right out of a movie. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, they made a very good movie about it because mm -hmm. it was right out of a movie. So right. I think a big question that a lot of people were wondering were the motives behind mm. this whole situation. Um, so him and his brother were motivated by Iraq and Afghanistan. They were very passionate about their religion, and they weren't connected to any terrorist groups at mm -hmm. all. So I think that was very interesting, and they were self-radicalized. Um, I know, I remember the younger brother, Johar Sarnaev, said he was trying to kind of follow his big brother's lead right. um, in the situation. So, yeah, and they also learned how to build this explosive from just watching the Internet, mm -hmm. from just something so small. So I think it's really crazy to see kind of how that unfolded. Mm -hmm. What about how law enforcement responded? Obviously the FBI mm -hmm. and the governor showed mm -hmm. up just minutes later. Mm -hmm. It was a question about should we call it terrorism and give it to the FBI? Is it a domestic dispute? Mm -hmm. Should Boston and the state of Massachusetts police handle it? You know, the whole thing unwinded. Mm -hmm. You know, it seemed like Boston was pretty happy to give it to the FBI, but the FBI was like, if we brand this as a terrorist attack, this is going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. I think a big thing um, with that was is they didn't know um, if there was going to be another bomb, if there was going to be another right. attack. So they didn't know how to go about this. Um, I think another thing which goes along with the motives is it was like very pinned on 9-11, which mm -hmm. is why they did that because these two brothers felt like they were being um, like targeted because of their race. Right. So I think labeling it as a terrorist attack right then kind of would set that precedent. And I don't know if law enforcement wanted to do that right away. Well, it was lucky enough that you had Rick Delorier, who was the FBI agent that took the case. He was planning on retiring. Mm -hmm. Like, he wasn't planning on mm -hmm. staying on board. It was this case that made him stay. Mm -hmm. Right. And obviously we do know he was not a fan of once they figured out who the two brothers were, which was it was a whole mess. We're not even going to get into how they figured out I was the two brothers. Mm -hmm. But Commissioner Ed Davis said we need to let the people of Boston, we need to let the state of Massachusetts know who these two people are. Mm -hmm. You know what Rick Delorier said? No, we're mm -hmm. not putting that conscience on people. What do right. you think of that decision? I personally think it was a good decision not to let the public know because I mean, they did end up knowing because someone, no one knows who, released the it photos. Had to have been right. Somebody from Boston. It had to be. Yeah. Um, but we saw kind of the public start to pinpoint these people just based on their race. They kind of tried to enter the case, and they weren't. They didn't know anything about the case, and it kind of like took law enforcement back a little bit. So mm -hmm. I think not releasing it to the public was a good decision, but that didn't end up happening. So my next question for you guys is, what do you think of Barack Obama? I mean, just three mm -hmm. days later showing up in Boston. I mean, that's security measures that they really can't afford to just pull from the investigation. Mm -hmm. I think it was really great that he showed up and kind of covered the situation. Right. I think as our president, that's something that's very important. Mm. And he made a speech just three days after. And I think it was really important and something that needed to be done. Um, yeah, I definitely mm -hmm. agree, especially, one, it being three days after. That mm -hmm. is such a short period of time when something as catastrophic as the bombing happens. And on top of that, he did it at the cathedral, which is such a big landmark in Boston. So I think it was such a great idea for him to be there to support everyone who was impacted by this. Yeah. 
it really showed that he cared about exactly. our country, and I think that's really important. Yeah, I also, speaking of on this topic, I want to talk about kind of the heroes of this case, and I think one of the main heroes was Danny Ming. Mm -hmm. um, and basically what happened was these two brothers carjacked him and forced him, They were he was driving to New York, and he was held at gunpoint, and he managed to escape these two brothers and call law enforcement telling them where they were heading. And I think he is a true hero in this case because he could have died, and this is what ended up um, with the shootout between the two brothers, right. which ended up ultimately killing one of the well others. I think what's so cool about it is that he was able to pinpoint they are in Watertown mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. is what's happening and on top of that he got out at a gas station yeah right. does everybody, yeah. Know, the, yeah. 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 Does everybody know the story of why or does everybody know the story of how they found out where his car was yes yes I do. He mm -hmm. was like an expert and he remembered the tracking number. He was yes. obsessed with his car. Yes. He was obsessed, obsessed with his car. Like, what are the chances I don't blame of him. That? Yeah. I mean, he's in America. We love our yeah. cars in America. Yeah, we get to drive these big things, these uh -huh. gas guzzlers. Oh my yeah. goodness. It was just so fortunate that yeah. he knew. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what yeah. are the chances of that he knew his crazy car's story. tracking All right, number. right yeah. before we wrap up, let's talk about Watertown. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Oh my goodness. Now that was straight out of a movie. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, one of the Zarnayev, the older Zarnayev brother, died. Tamerlan. Um, yep. Somehow he got shot. I believe it was six or seven times. Then got run yes. over by his brother in a damaged SUV. Mm -hmm. yep. Still was able to breathe for another twenty minutes. Died in an ambulance. I mean, they wanted yep. him alive. They wanted to question him. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. couldn't get anything out of him. His brother. I think his brother's biggest mistake was running over his right. brother. Should have right. figured it out. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was right. not a smart decision on no. his behalf. And then he hit in a boat. What do you think yeah. of that? Yeah. That was that was insane. And oh, yeah. when they when the guy called and basically said, "There's blood on my boat," and it ended up being this mass like killer of, of the Boston right. bombings and something that was really interesting with that was they said we can't interview a corpse so they mm -hmm. needed him alive yep. they that was exactly that brings yeah. us mm -hmm. to a hero too you were talking about a hero of the case was Danny Ming what about Sergeant Jeffrey Puglis mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Watertown he was a total hero he mm -hmm. wanted to be a cop since he was 15 years old he was a cop he retired only because the law made him mm -hmm. the state of Massachusetts can't be a cop a month after you turn the age of 65 but he was a hero you know he uh, went against police training and he flanked the individuals shooting right. at the Watertown right. police. He shot the guy six or seven times, attacked yeah. him, you know, without proper, you know, SWAT gear on. And, you know, mm -hmm. he was really just a hero. Yeah. So. Well, to bring it back to earlier in our conversation, the whole thing with the older brother being killed first, like we've said, the younger brother was looking up to the older brother. Like, mm -hmm. he wanted to follow in his footsteps. Mm -hmm. So I think that the older brother going first was so detrimental to right. how this right. case ended up. Right, yeah. I think he was almost a little lost. Mm -hmm. He kind exactly. of saw the older brother as a guidance on kind of what to do. And I think when he ended up dying, he kind of was like, where do I go next? Like, what are my next moves? Right. Closing statements, guys. We're going to wrap it up with the trial. That was crazy. Anybody want to explain? Oh. The trial. Basically, yeah. the younger brother was sentenced to death, but then it was appealed because two jurors um, lied in mm -hmm. their jury selection. Right. So it went all the way to the Supreme Court. It mm -hmm. changed the course of law enforcement forever, mm -hmm. and he is still on death row yeah. to this day, sentenced to death. He's being yeah. held in a supermax in Colorado. Wow, what a crazy sequence of mm -hmm. events. We hopefully have more crime segments coming to everyone watching Nittany Talk. So that's all we have for today. It was a wild week in Boston in 2013. Boston mm -hmm. Marathon's back at it, stronger than ever. That's just wonderful. We're going to send it right back to you, Mr. Vitale. Thank you, Ryan. It's so important to remember these events so we can be better in the future. Even a decade later, we send our thoughts and prayers to those who were affected and are still affected today. We'll be right back. Turtleneck sweater, skinny leggings, Ugg boots. Right. Ugg, Ugg boots? It's yeah. great to see <laughs> how that has yeah. yes. evolved. Welcome back to Nittany Talk. In the summer, our wardrobes are typically limited to t-shirts and shorts, but as the fall weather approaches, we can expand our outfits. We can now wear flannels, sweatshirts, cargo pants, jeans, and more, helping us look stylish without being all bundled up by a huge puffer jacket that tends to ruin the outfit. It's typically one or the other, comfort or coziness, but can they be combined? Let's send it over to the crew to discuss the latest fashion trends for the fall. Thanks, Danny. Fall is such a fun time of year. You have the leaves changing colors, the fall activities, the holidays, but my personal favorite, you have the fashion. I'm here with Kate Delmonico, Audrey Keller, and Joy Donald to talk about some of the fall fashion trends of 2023. I think this year the fashion trends have been really exciting. There's some consistent trends, there's some new trends, but there's been a lot of outfits that I've definitely seen on the street, and I'm like, yeah, that. I'm gonna make a note of that. Let's let's make sure to put that in the outfit rotation. What do you guys <laughs> yes. have been thinking about the consistent fall trends? Like, what do we think has been a staple of fall? 
I feel like the most basic <laughs> staple is going to be the flannels. Everybody loves yep. a good flannel. They never go out of style. I feel like that's just classic fall. What do you guys think? Are you a fan of the flannels? Do you think they need to retire? Honestly, I love a good flannel, but I can't say I own one. I really need to get <laughs> on the trend, but I love them. I love them, but I just don't own one. I think I agree. I don't really, I think I have like one like big like flannel coat that I wear, but I don't have like an everyday like flannel type. I feel like you mostly see the flannels on like the guys, they have their hoodie and the yeah. flannel, like, the typical guy fall outfit, but with girls I feel like it's been very different, like you have some of like the typical flannels, but like you guys were saying, you see like the flannel coats, I think they're cute, I think they're a great staple for fall in and of itself, but another thing we've been seeing a lot of is the flare pants. Yes. yes. Absolutely. I have a pair right here, I wear these twice a week. <laughs> Minimum. I, yeah. It's just, I think it's such a good take on what used to be in, which was the skinny leggings. Mm -hmm. And like the, like the fall, like autumn, like look was like a turtleneck sweater, skinny leggings, Ugg boots. Right. Ugg, Ugg boots. It's yeah. great to see <laughs> how that has <laughs> yeah. yes. evolved. Going on that flare, honestly, I can say that these flare jeans are probably one of my favorite things right now. I... Like when I'm not wearing my flare leggings, honestly, these jeans, they're just like such a nice like pop of color to mm -hmm. that original flare kind of fashion. I mm -hmm. just love it. I mean, it's definitely a mix of that comfy and cute because that's one of the biggest things I think when it comes to fashion. It's cold in the fall. You want to be comfy, you want to be warm, but you don't want to be, you want to look cute, you know? So that, right. I feel like these kind of pieces are a big staple into mm -hmm. keeping the outfit cute, but also cozy. I love a pair of cozy flare leggings. Yes. Right. <laughs> And then another thing we have, the vest and the puffer jackets. I brought mine because who doesn't love a good a good vest and a good puffer mm -hmm. jacket, you know? Right. I think they're cozy. I especially love these for fall because it's not too hot, you don't have the sleeves, but it's just like, it's an iconic look. Yes. Right. Yeah. I'm surprised I've been seeing them. I literally saw probably 15 girls wearing the exact same like uh, black puffer vest and they <laughs> yeah. all look so cute. I was like, I need to hop on that. I know. Yeah. Well, especially because we talk about like the crew necks, right? And right. Yes. The, the, the vests with the crew necks is another big fall fashion trend. Yes, I love just a good, cozy, oversized crew neck. Like when I'm just walking to class and it's just a little bit chilly, but I don't quite want to wear a jacket, just the crew necks are a perfect alternative to that and kind of older hoodie we see like without the hood. And mm -hmm. I just think it's honestly perfect. Yes. yes. I'm a huge fan of the layering, so I always, either if I have a crew neck on, I have a vest over it, or sometimes I do, I like a good turtleneck with a vest over it for fall as well. Right. I feel like that's cute. I love when girls and everyone, they put the layers. I think it's a really good way to um, mix up an outfit. I think a lot of these are like the consistent pieces that you mm -hmm. see a lot in Penn State. And I think like minimalistic, you know, like maybe yes. a little, a vest, the puffer, the hoodies, the crew necks, the flare leggings. I feel like that's been a big thing this year. I also think like you were saying, um, Turtlenecks, I think they're making a comeback. Yeah, they are. When I was younger, I can honestly say I hated the crew necks. <laughs> it was so itchy, so hot, but now I can't live without my, my turtlenecks. They're so cute and comfy, and they honestly are a good alternative to scarves. That's a good point. And plus, you know, I every time I think of the turtleneck, I think of the rock and that like classic. Oh, yes. 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 The yes. mom yes. jeans and the turtleneck. And mom jeans are still, I think, a pretty big thing, even though we've kind of switched to the flare mm -hmm. leggings. I feel like we've been seeing a lot of mom jeans too. What do you guys think about those? I really like mom jeans. Honestly, it's a perfect in-between between skinny jeans and a little baggy. Like, it really brings, like, a cute 90s feel to the jean scene. I honestly really like it. I'm personally a fan of wide legs, so I'm not yeah, more, yeah, I'm that's, more yeah. wide leg versus mom jean or, like, cargo or, like, boot cut. Mm -hmm. I've been really into mm -hmm. lately. Yes. I'm a huge fan of the cargo pants, which you brought up, and I think that's a great um, staple for fall as well. You mm -hmm. can... Totally, the coloring with that, I agree. It's like matches with everything. They're a little more neutrals. It's a little more fall. I love a good cargo pant. I think the wide leg was a good point. I think I've been seeing more wide leg pant than I have mom jeans, mm -hmm. but I'm with you. I love a good wide leg pant. I think it's cute, comfy. Again, mixing cute and comfy. You get, you get the best of both yes. worlds. But it's also been interesting to see some of the newer trends that I was looking in at Vogue because who else would you go to for fashion advice? Absolutely. And there have been some interesting new trends that they are anticipating for this fall, one of which being maxi skirts. I'm a huge fan of maxi skirts. I have like five. I love them. And then once it gets cold, like it's still, you still look really nice. You can put a pair of like fleece line leggings underneath. Mm. No one will know they're there. Perfect. And you'll still look great. Right. 
honestly, I think with the maxi skirts, my favorite part is just, it's not too long to where it's, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, but it's like the, it's not too short to where you're freezing outside. I really mm -hmm. like a good maxi skirt. I also have been seeing trench coats are apparently coming back. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I'm on board with trench coats, but yeah. Vogue says it's the next thing. What do you guys think? <laughs> I'm very hesitant on that as well. I personally feel like that's not something I'll be adding to my wardrobe, but Vogue is usually always on to something, so I would not be surprised if we're going to be seeing that in the stores coming this in the next couple of months. Well, I also think maybe not like college, you might not see trench coats too much, but longer um, winter jackets. I'm a huge fan of long mm -hmm. winter jackets. I think they look really cool. They look really classy like when they're styled right. So I'm down for trench coats coming back. I think the right person can pull it off really well. Mm. I think trench coats is a really cute way, especially if you pop a little bit of color in there, mm -hmm. especially I've been seeing a lot of red on the market, like the yes. deep burgundy, or some people even say like that bright cherry red is coming back. Mm. Yeah. And with the trench coat, I think that could be a, be bold, be a power move. Well, that was another thing, rich red, that color. They're anticipating that is a big color for this fall. What do you guys think about that? Because I personally don't think I'm a fan of red. I don't, I'm not sure. I just, it's not my thing. <laughs> I'm okay. a big fan of red. Yeah. I'm wearing it today. <laughs> I just, I'm obsessed with it. And like the fall 2023 runway trends, it's just been affirming my yeah. belief that red <laughs> is a great color. <laughs> I have to say, I agree with you. I'm a huge um, fan of red. I think it's nice to add a pop of color into your outfit. And I've been seeing a lot of the red nail, which I know you have going on over there as well. Ooh, they're <laughs> super chipped. Maybe don't. <laughs> but I, I do see that as a fall trend that I think I want to I wanna give that a try myself, honestly. Especially because, you know, you got the neutral colors, so adding those fun yeah. pop of colors. But I definitely can't wait to see all the fall outfits that are going to come back this year. Um, but that's sadly all we have time for today. So back to you, Danny. Thank you, Jordan. Well, I just got my new Uggs, and they are so comfy. I'm excited to wear them. That's all we have for this week's episode. It has been a blast discussing the latest in politics, entertainment, crime, and fashion. Thank you for joining us for Nittany Talk. I'm Danny Vitale, and we hope to see you next week.